Hello, Brian. Hello, Francois. Francois, I'm super excited to be doing this interview. I am joined today by Francois Benamias, international CEO of Audemars Piguet, uh, who is taking the time from his schedule to uh, do an interview with Washbox. Thanks, Francois. You're welcome, sir. Just one thing to, to, to correct a, a, every single step of the way right now. We've known each other for how long? I would say probably sometime in Philadelphia in my, maybe if I, when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old. Okay, so 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Okay, so repeat after me. Francois Benamias. Francois Benamias. You see? Now yeah. it. <laughs> Super easy. Good. Now we can start. So it's customary uh, at the beginning of our interviews to do a wrist check. This is what I wear today, the brand new Code 1159 with a burgundy dial and, and band. I've been waiting to see that color on a watch for over a decade. It finally came. It took me a half a second to put the first one on my wrist. Some of my friends saw it and already bought it or ordered it. And uh, the feedback we get from all the colors of this new line are pretty actually good lately. My favorite that just came out is the purple. I love purple as well. You and I could have lived together. <laughs> so today I am wearing a, an older piece. This is a uh, Quantum Perpetual Automatic from the late 70s. I thought, what better watch to wear? The watch came out in 1978. It was the world's thinnest automatic movement, perpetual at the time. For me, what made it special is that it was a contributing factor to Audemars Piguet getting through the crisis at the time, which was the ports crisis. You know, they responded quickly to the crisis. They came out with this watch, which was so against, you know, let's call it a quartz watch coming out with an ultra thin automatic. And it really helped take them to another level. And I think that we're in a crisis today you know, many of our viewers are at home right now, whether they're in quarantine or they're working from home. So, you know, I can think of no better segue into talking about the crisis that we're in. And AP responded quickly then. And I just, you know, want to ask you what you guys are doing now to respond to the current crisis. Uh, on a global level, not on the automatic level, on the global level, I would say that if I want to look at the glass half full, we're going to see more innovation and creativity than before. The world needs creativity and innovation. And if we talk about AP at Audemars Piguet, then yes, we've been working very, very seriously about what could come next. The good news was, and during confinement, we were, our entire R&D department was able to work and to keep working with all the systems. Everything was ready for them to keep working. And I saw in the last two weeks to three weeks, two major inventions, I'm talking about inventions that we change the world of watchmaking, and it will be at Audemars Piguet. You see, you wanted uh, me to tease you a little bit. Here it is, sir. I guess no, no tidbits forthcoming then. Nope. Wow, that's great. So, you know, we, we spoke at the very beginning how long I've known you, but uh, I remember my first SIHH, one of the most exciting appointments that I had was, it was 08, 09. Um, I was in college at the time. I came to SIHH during break while studying abroad, and I had the opportunity to come and see all the appointments. And you were at the brand then, and again, sailing the brand through a, another, another crisis that had happened, you know, the 08 crash. And, and I think that it's A, exceptional and, and unique that someone like yourself would be at a brand for as long as you have, which is so different than a lot of the I'd say a lot of the other groups in our industry where, you know, you've, you've got blips or people are there for a couple of years and, and it's hard for them to get that full long-term perspective in terms of where they want to take the brand. And I guess one of the things that I was most interested in and in having the opportunity to talk to you was you have that long-term perspective. You've been at the brand for a long time. A, how would you coach the rest of the, you know, rest of the industry in this time? But B, where do you see uh, Audemars Piguet going? Well, the first thing is, yes, I've been working uh, with Audemars Piguet for 26 years now. So that's a long time. And what I have to say is, the way we look at the picture now is, I want to listen more and more and more to the young generations coming, you and even the younger ones, because we're going to see so much and so many changes in the world we're living in. We are at a crossroad of so many innovations. Um, that will impact our lifestyles, our health, our way to behave, and the way we're going to communicate with each other. 
that if we are not ready to learn and to relearn potentially, then we're going to be in trouble. And there is only one solution to do that the right way, is to listen to our kids. They are the one, and now you have three, so you'll see, but we have to see what's happening in their mind because they are not looking at the world the way we've been looking at the world. The rules are not the, are not the same anymore. You don't teach the same way to these kids anyway. And, and we're going to see a lot of things that we're not used to. So you have to be willing to accept the it will not be the same ever again. Yes, we have some rules that will still apply. Like when you give your word to someone, you better keep, keep your word and behave the right way in respect of the others. But beside that, you have to open the door to what could come next. And I'm a firm believer of what you don't know. I want to learn on the what I don't know to run the business. And I'm very curious about what's going on in many, many industries. And we have all our eyes open to what's going on in the world and potentially change what we're doing now. We, we've learned during this confinement that we will not look at the client the same way ever again. We have to change the way we've been dealing with the end consumer for good because there is definitely an after COVID. There was a before, there is an after, they will never be the same, and we have to adjust and to change the way we've been behaving towards these clients. So you, know, you mentioned change. Do you think that the luxury experience has changed in terms of A, what the client wants or what they're going to want after this? Let's put it this way. When people were stuck in their homes, every weekend I was shooting a video for all the employees of Audemars Piguet. And on the third weekend, I asked all the employees, we have 2,000 people working for the brand, to ask their kids, whether they would be three years old or 25 years old, how would they perceive the after COVID-19? And I got drawings, emails, videos, uh, letters, name it. I got a lot of answers. Two things came out of that. The first one, Yes, when you work for Audemars Piguet, your first need is not food, obviously. We're not talking about people who have other issues. Every single one of them spoke about love. But not the love like, I've got two million friends on Facebook. No, no, no. I want to be able to hug my grandfather or my grandmother. I want to be able to give a kiss to my girlfriend or to my uh, brother who is living somewhere else. They spoke about true love that was the first thing which is actually we are all human and that's the first thing we live with every single day so that was one and the second thing was they looked at us the parents and say guys you've been the right word would be the f word but i'm going to use a better word you've been affecting affecting the integrity of our planet for decades and decades you're going to go away. At some point, you're going to die. We are staying here. We're going to have kids. You have to change the way you behave because you're wasting a lot of energies because of the egos of the people here and there, you are not treating our planet correctly. Change. That was the most an order to us, the older ones. And three days later, I got the idea of how we're going to change and adjust what we had been thinking about towards the client because of these two comments. I cannot go into more details because... I mean, it's like the perfect segue into what's the idea. Uh, no, I won't tell you. I won't tell you now. But, right. it's, but I, can, I can guarantee you this goes far beyond the watch industry. It goes to the whole luxury industry, whether it's a hotel, a restaurant, a fashion store, the car, watches, jewelry, it's everything. We cannot deal with the clients the same way we've been doing it for the last 20 to 30 years. I agree. And, you know, my dad coined the term personal commerce, you know, not e-commerce, but personal commerce because, you know, you're looking to build relationships with a client that's bigger than just a click and buy, right? Like the internet's not the end all and be all. It's, and I think that you, you're a believer in this, right? That it's, it's a place to get educated. Um, you know, you mentioned in other interviews that you've done that it's, that it's a tool, but it's not, it's not the end all and be all. You don't see luxury products just, you know, people just clicking and buying. There's, there's a level of human interaction that needs to occur. And you, 
you know, in that same article, you also mentioned that you delivered 40 of the new remaster watch, um, which means that during this crisis, there were 40 customers that received watches that didn't physically come into a store to experience, you know, the unboxing and putting on the watch. They had that opportunity to do that at home. Do you see that being a part of, of the plan? 150 million percent. We're going to call this dematerialization of retail. Mm -hmm. I don't need four walls to sell you a watch tomorrow. When you talk about luxury, no matter what it is, again, it's not about watches, it could be anything else. What do you want? You want to be touched in the part of your brain that's going to deal with certain emotions. And emotions could be and could happen in the form of a watch, a piece of art, a pair of shoes, handbags, clothes, anything. Any type of emotions. Emotions are between people. A computer will not give you an emotion. You could hear someone sing on YouTube and potentially be in touch, but at some point it will never replace the direct connection if you would hear that voice straight into your ears, face to face. So what we are looking at now is really what are we going to do tomorrow that's going to trigger this relationship and emotions a lot better. And don't get me wrong, it's not a matter of saying we have to be on top of our clients every single day and night. No. There, was, there is one guy named Brunello Cuccinelli. He's got his own fashion brand. And I met Brunello three years ago now. And they use a word, a sentence which I love a lot. He said at Brunello Cuccinelli, we are butlers, we are not stokers. How many emails, how many times do you want to call someone if he doesn't want anything? And he doesn't want to be bothered. So luxury, in a certain way, is like really dancing. You have to adjust all the time. If you're too far, there is zero feeling. If you're too close, you're going to step on each other's feet. So you have to relearn the notion of interacting with a client. And I have to say that maybe in our industry, the future is not looking to hire people who have been working for the same industry for 10 or 20 years, but maybe com completely outside of it, and towards much more the world of hospitality. And maybe the next salespeople we're going to hire come from the restaurant business, hotel industry, bars. We'll see. But it's very important to reassess completely the experience between people. I've always thought that you know time is a luxury and that people want to interact with a brand at their own pace, at their own time, wherever they want to do it. And that it's the brand's responsibility to keep up with that and to, I'd say, elevate itself to being on the customer's terms. And you guys have always done a good job at that. So, you know, kudos. We are, we've been doing an okay job, I have to say. We're still many, making, no, we're still many, making many mistakes every day. Every day. Especially over the last four or five years where the demand has increased so much and on certain references that how do you say no correctly to someone without looking arrogant or like you don't care at all? And it's a very fine line between making people feel welcome or making people feel completely rejected by a brand. And we are not perfect, far from it, but I can guarantee you that we're going to work on this like there is no tomorrow. I'd rather spend more money on these experiences between people than spending and than hiring the famous architect to redesign all our stores. So segueing a little bit into, you know, you mentioned watches that you say no to. So for me, it's like a cue that we can talk about pre-owned a little bit. So you've got a primary market, which is watches being sold as new. And then you've got the pre-owned market where there's, you know, pre-owned watches, which has been growing exponentially year over year for a long time. And, you know, you were probably the first actually, like the first person from the primary side to actually talk about the pre-owned space to say like, Hey guys, like it's here. It's not going anywhere. You can't avoid it. Like you've avoided the internet. I'm going to quote you on a line, which I thought couldn't have been more perfect. The secondary market is a mirror of who you are. And you know, I couldn't obviously agree more with the sentiment. And I just want to talk a little bit about how you see moving forward, a brand like Audemars Piguet and a company like Watchbox coexisting in the same space. So first of all, yes, I was, I think, one of the very first ones to talk about the pre-owned business, which I said could be 10 times as big, bigger, 10 times bigger than the new business. And your dad 
who has been a very firm advocate of this for a long, long time before I even say one word, actually was very pleased when I finally opened, opened the gate, say, that's coming. He was. So he was after me the following second, say, oh, 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 this is a big river, this is a big river. <laughs> but I have to say, your father, I would say 90% of the time, have always been right of seeing the future of the industry. So kudos to that. It's not a joke. I mean it. I see it. And it's impressive. Now, this business is going to be so big, so big, because you have Watchbox, but you have many players today. Bushire is one of them as well. And you get, you're going to get a lot more players in that field. The brand also will become their own, I guess. I'm going to repeat that. The brand will do it on their own, I guess. <laughs> So we'll see what's going to happen. But there is room for everyone. We shouldn't close the door to any possibilities at that stage because everyone, everyone is still learning how to play with that. There are many implications. But what the most important thing that we need to focus on is what type of service are we going to give our clients as a customer experience? Is it going to be a good one or is it going to be a bad one? What do we have to do to make sure that when we press the button start, it's done the right way? Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest question. The question is not if we have to do it or with who we have to do it. As I said, it's not close the door to anything. It's much more how. What are we going to do to make it as perfect as possible? Definitely. And I think that, you know, as you said, it's not, it's not an if, it's a how, right? Like when you get back to it, it's what the customer wants. And I think that that's how we, any decision that we make here really just comes back down to what do we think the customer wants? And then how do we then execute our own plan to accomplish that? And I think that one of the shifts that's happened by having pre owned become more and more prevalent is the transparency that's been created in the watchmaking industry, right? And when I look at Audemars, you know, you guys cater to so many different types of consumers. You, you know, you cater to high-end collectors that want ultra complicated movements. You, you cater to celebrities and athletes. You cater to consumers that want the hot new thing. And I've been fascinated by that because there's not many other brands that have that diverse clientele group all the way across the board. And I'm just, I wonder like, how you approach that situation knowing that you're having to cater to so many different people at one time. You're going to laugh at my answer because we don't look at it that way at all. First of all, there is not a single session, hear me loud and clear, not one, where we define any kind of age group, okay, where we say, okay, that's going to be for 20 to 30 years old, that's going to be for 30 to 50 years old, because the world is teaching us every day that enough of wanting to put people in boxes. Who are we to say, okay, a woman will always want a light color dial. A kid will, will only buy an offshore. No, it doesn't work this way. It's a mix of everything. And because of that, we learn every single day that what we thought about might not be exactly right. I gave a speech the, uh, the biggest university in Taiwan, in Taipei, actually, a year ago. There were 160 kids, 20 to 24 years old. 160 kids. I always start my speeches by asking, we are, we are in Taipei, huh? in a very techno, technology country or oriented, technology oriented country, sorry. I said, who is wearing a smartwatch? Out of 160, how many were wearing one? Let's say 10. One. How many were wearing a watch? 140. No, but it was more than half. How many were wearing a P? So I just want you to know up front, I read the article, it was three. Okay, which was unbelievable. And when I spoke about it, we, we had put a sort of a, of a box at the end of a, when they would exit the place where we could get resumes if they were interested. We got 94 resumes after the speech. So we, what does it mean? One, watchmaking is not old. Two, when things are done with a true craftsmanship, 
parent exclusivity. We can talk to a 15 years old and we can talk to a 70 years old. So no more of these rules of it's not going to appeal to the younger generation. Completely wrong. And because of that, we've relearned how to look at the way we have to communicate. So the only thing we've been adjusting for the last three, four years, words. You know, before it was very uh, the proper language, the long sentences, the beautiful stories, which were sometimes very uh, boring. <laughs> now, we make shorter sentences because your generation talks in shorter words with the emojis and the thing and the signs and the whole thing. But it's the same. And it's funny because we just opened our museum a few days ago. We've seen already a lot of people coming with their kids. And the kids are like amazed. And they say, one day, I want to have another map to get watch on my wrist. So to end up your, to answer your question, it's never a matter of, uh, it's much more enough of putting people in boxes. Let's the world ride. I want to talk about code for a little bit. You know, I don't want to say I was in the room where it happened, but I was at the show where it happened. You know, I've been in, let's call it the watch industry for the better most of my life, but I've been actively engaged for the last 10 years. And I think that for me, it was one of the most pivotal turning points in our industry. And the reason is that when the watch launched, you had you had good reactions and you had bad reactions. You had people that loved it, and then you had people that that didn't like it so much. And for me, it was hated it. Hated it. We use the word hate. So for me, it was the first time that I saw social media really sort of like lead the path. Like you know, really see another side of it. And you know, whether they're trolls or not, because again, there's always going to be trolls and people that hate on things that are new and come out. For me, it was like a turning point because I think that it really woke up the rest of the industry to, to, to really see that there's this whole online community out there and that they want to voice their opinions and they want to be a part of it. And you know, I just want to get your, what your reaction to the situation was and where you see the line going. So first of all, when we launched the line, and we got crushed on the very first days. But the people that went after us, it's a very small community, very small. And, you know, that's a part of today's game. Social media is a new game in town, and you have to be able to, to deal with it no matter what. You have to understand, today when you do something publicly, no matter what you do, you release a song, a book, a movie, a, a, a fashion show, no matter what it is, you're going to find Lovers and haters. And that's a new game in town. You have to be able to deal with it. But what matters is a long-term view. If we would have had social media in 1972, where every single watch that was selling then was thin, in precious metal, on straps, what do you think would have been the reaction? George Jota would have been crucified, OK? And Gerard Jatta is today the Picasso of the watch industry. He's known to be maybe the most famous and the most incredible and most creative designer that the world of watches has ever, ever seen. But if social media would have been existing in 1972, it would have been a complete disaster. So when we got hit by this sort of uh, bad and very, very important negativity, in my mind, I was completely fine in my, in, in, in my head for one reason. That the year before, at the end of the year, it was the 23rd or 24th of November, we got all our people, the employee of Odemartiga in Switzerland, under one roof. Okay? And we showed them that they had a collection, including Code 1159, because we wanted to share with every single employee what the brand was doing, where we were going, why we were doing what we were doing, and how much the whole thing is doing. And you have to understand, the watchmaker from the Valley de Joux here, uh, they have a voice. If they don't like something, they will say to your face, no doubt, if you don't behave the right way, they'll come after you. I mean, there is no, there is not such a thing here as, oh, I'm too shy, I don't, I don't, I don't want to raise my voice and say something. When they don't like, the finish of the case, or the hands are too thick, or the watch is too heavy, or there is this, they will say to you. 
when they look at the collection code in 1159, it was pretty much only compliments. And they were very proud of the work accomplished by a lot of them. And we were 1,200 people in a room. And when we left the room, we left as one. One person strong to say we're going to launch maybe one of the most important watches in the last 20 years. So when we got attacked at the beginning, I said, let it go. Let it go. We have to focus. We are not here to run 100 meters. We are here for a very, very long marathon. So let's see what's going to happen. Through the course of the SI change, a lot of good compliments came. More people looked at the watch, started to compliment the watch the way you were saying it. And slowly but surely, we got feedback and sales, and better feedback and sales. And we finished the year pretty much on par to what we're expecting. Now we launched the new things, the new colors, everything. The reactions are pretty good right now. I haven't seen the latest from uh, our good friends from the other side yet. Okay, we'll see what they say. Personally, I don't care. Yeah. Because I do care about our clients. And if somebody wants to trash the watch, it's a free world. Trash whatever you want. At the end, the answer will always be the feel. You know, in the in a in the boxing fight, before the fight, they trash each other, they talk a lot. No, no. And then there is a fight. There is normally one guy standing at the end. <laughs> we'll see. But we won't see in three months. We won't see in six months. We'll see in five to ten years. Because maybe 10 years from now, people will look and say, you remember? You remember when COVID-19 got launched? It was like a complete disaster for three days, for six months. But 10 years later, they've managed to make this a new pillar of the automatic line. We'll see. Whenever I tell my dad no, one of the things he always responds back to me with is, whenever you say no, it just makes me feel yes that much more. And I think it's very similar in that, you know, as many no's or comments that are going to be out there, there's always going to be people that love the watch. And when you're starting something new, you take all the punches. And when he was starting in the pre-owned space or anything that he's done, he's always taken punches. And he's always, oh, you're wrong. You're this. It's not going to work. Nobody's, you know, nobody's going to want to buy a pre-owned watch. You're not going to be able to sell online. And then you blink and 10 years goes by and you're a genius. And I think that for me, that's one of the remarkable things is that people will hate on something when they feel like they can, but that, that, that all changes from the success and that it goes from being hated to the person's a genius to it being wow. And then I think that time will tell and, but you know, you guys are poised for that, so. Only time will tell. I cannot wait to see what's going to happen. There is so much we still could do. I've got only one thing. I'm, 50, I'm going to be 56 in a few weeks. And I look at it and say, wow, I've been working for IP for 26 years. And I would love to be already 30 years ahead and see what's going to happen. No, I won't work for 30 more years at other market yet, trust me. But I would love to see what's going to happen. Where would be the US market? 30 years from now, because when I came in 1999, the market was always looked at like nothing. There is nothing happening there. They don't know about watchmaking. There is no culture of watchmaking. It will never work. It will be impossible. Exactly compared to what exactly same to what you were saying before. The more you tell me no, the more you tell me it's going to be impossible. The more I'm going to prove you wrong. And when you look at it 20 years later, US market number one, more business than ever. We just opened a store in Dallas two weeks ago. On the first week, we sold 30 watches. First week in Dallas. When I came to the US, Dallas was not even in our radar because in the Midwest, there was not so much. So I want to, to, uh, to, uh, to think about it as. Really, what Mohammed Ali said, I use that quote a lot because I love Mohammed Ali saying that the best is yet to come. I do believe that we haven't seen the end of the growth of the watchmaking industry. And if there is one country I've always loved building it, it's the US. 
you know, I'm young, I'm 33. And, you know, I always have these conversations with well, a, my dad and other people when he, you know, and he says like, do you think people are always going to want watches? You know, you've got smartphones, you've got all these things and we always come back to the same, to the same answer that it's not necessarily a, a need anymore, right? It's not 1975. You don't need the watch to tell time. You're, you're buying it for a different reason. Now you're buying it because it's a want, you know, something, something about it evokes something in you. You want to make the purchase and it could be for many different reasons, but as, but as long as there's that want, there's always going to be a desire for fine wristwatches. And it just, you know, it gives me confidence that I'm in, that I'm in the right space and we're moving in the right direction. You know, I've got a daughter, I've got two daughters, but one is actually 24 years old and she lives in Los Angeles and she's living, lived in the U.S. since she was three. So she's completely American. And for her 20th birthday, I wanted to give her a watch. But she never wore a watch in her life, not a flip flight, not a swatch, not anything. And so I didn't want this to be a surprise. So I told her, listen, I want you to wear a watch. But if you don't want to wear one, don't. So this is what you're going to do. I'm going to fly you here to them, come to the Brasso, to the headquarters, to all the facilities, and tell me if you want the watch. And she came back after two hours. And she said, you know what, Dad? This is the first time in my life that I see something that will last. Because when you think about it, the young generation, this is what I call the throwaway generation. Nothing lasts. You got the iPhone 5, the 6 comes, 5, garbage. 7 comes, garbage. 8 comes, six, 7, garbage. And on and on and on and on. The way you guys order food, it's not the same way we were eating when we were with our parents. You say, what do you want to eat tonight? You want to eat Chinese? Indian, Japanese, uh, this, French, whatever, you in, out, it goes fast. She looked at the watch and said, you know what? I see something that we left, and I got so much emotions delivered by all these people, I want to wear one. So she got a watch, flew back to Los Angeles. What'd she get? She got the uh, stainless steel, uh, basic, uh, single wire oak, simple, 24 years old. Okay, she's not going to get a great call. Okay? <laughs> the funny thing is, then she shared the story. She shared the story with her friends. And she managed just by telling the story to make her four of her friends to buy an AP watch in Los Angeles. Just by sharing the story. So it will never be a matter of age. It's a matter of what emotions are going to trigger. That's still going to make people say, that touches me. And I'm going to get a part of that world. So when I look at the industry and I look at who do I think is best poised for the long term and who's most stable and has been doing it right. You know, there's yourselves and, but the other three are, are independently owned as well. You know, they're, they're family, they're either family owned or independently owned. And I, I, having to live quarter to quarter has been devastating for, for certain, for certain companies. And I, and I think that's, that's actually highlighted in that one of the things that I read that I thought was so remarkable is that during the crisis, out of the 2,000 employees, AP did not let go of or change the salary of one employee. And I thought that that was amazing when you're, when you're reading reports uh, on what some of the other groups are doing in terms of how they're handling the situation and what they're doing and how that was, a, you know, let's call it a PR nightmare, but, you know, that it's, that it's commendable and it's actually special. I'd say I call it all the employees is that it, it really is one big global family. I always say, you know, if we could uh, ask a thousand people five minutes before they die, five minutes before they die, will they regret the most? Are they going to regret that they lost uh, 20 million in revenue on something? Or they could have sold more watches or more dresses or more handbags? Or they could have done, no. They will always talk about the time they missed to the people they love. And at the end, we are living in a business of emotions. Emotions are triggered by humans talking to humans. Okay, and because of that, it's very important to understand that you have to protect the integrity of these people because when they know that the brand behind them is going to support them no matter what, then in return, what we get as a commitment, as a dedication to protect the business is unbelievable. And money cannot buy that at all. And if you could tour right now, our headquarter in Switzerland, you'd be amazed in the middle of the biggest crisis that the world has lived, okay, over the last 
four years that everybody here has a big smile on their face. Awesome. Very well said. And this was great. You know, I, I, I really appreciate the time. Uh, the insight, and uh, I know that like our Watchbox viewers are as in the watch game as it gets, and I think that they'll really appreciate the, the frankness of the conversation and, and really just getting an insight into your world, so thank you again. Okay, so guys, thank you so much. Thanks, Francois. Ciao. Bye-bye.